Well, they tell me it's been a very, very sharp increase. Now, let's just go ahead and put that in perspective. I don't want to scare any parents out there. These numbers are, of course, significantly lower than what we're seeing in adults. But hospitals like Randall's Children's as well as Dornbecker both tell me that it isn't in the dozens that they've been seeing over the past couple of months, which should be a concern for us all. Cases are up. Hospitalizations are up. And it's just the beginning of the Omicron surge. COVID clearly is being seen throughout the hospital population again. So that that's Dr. Malika Little, a pediatrician at Randall Children's Hospital. She says from adults to kids, everyone is getting hit. The percentage of kids that we're having in the hospital that have COVID um, really at its highest point that we've ever seen. Across town, a similar story. The first number that goes up are the cases. This is Dr. Carl Erickson. He's a pediatrician at Dornbecker Children's Hospital. We actually today have more kids hospitalized in Oregon than we have at any point during the pandemic. They both agree kids are getting hit like adults, sometimes symptomatic, sometimes not, sometimes severe, other times mild. One thing is for certain. They say anyone eligible should get vaxxed and boosted. And parents, it's your decision that will help keep your kids safe and healthy. I would say be thoughtful about how um, you're what, about exposing you and your family to um, a lot of other people. Um, those, a lot of those are individual kinds of decisions, but the more careful people are right now when we have more people getting infected than we have at any time during the pandemic, the better job we can do of collectively blunting this surge. So, of course, I know I'm not telling you anything you don't know, but doctors do say getting your vaccination and your booster shot are vital to keeping you healthy throughout this pandemic and keeping those symptoms. If you do get COVID, mild. What they say we absolutely have to do right now, though, is reignite our passion and commitment to our safety precautions and make sure you are wearing a well-fitted mask. Well, Deb, the school district says it has a pool of 600 subs and it adds that more should be coming. It says thanks to a new ruling regarding substitute teachers, the district should be getting about 200 more subs this month. That is good news, but there is no doubt that what's happening right now is really challenging for schools. In addition to those 600 subs in PPS's pool, the district's chief human resources officer, Sharon Reese, says PPS is also deploying central office staff to help with classroom support. It's an all-hands-on-deck situation all across the country. In Texas, there's even a school district asking parents to step in. We just decided to be innovative. I prefer that instead of desperate, obviously. Um, we uh, are just extending the offer to uh, parents uh, just to allow them to come in and help us out. PBS says it too is working to involve parents more. Reese saying the teachers union has asked the district to implement quote a uniform process for parents who want to volunteer in schools. But I retired as an English teacher three years ago. Michael Cunningham is one of the 600 PPS subs. He has been hesitant to take any job opportunities recently, partly because of fear of COVID, but he's strongly considering a long-term sub gig in a few weeks. He's only licensed to sub in the Portland district. If he wanted to help out elsewhere, he'd have to submit another application, which he says can be tedious. Do you think streamlining the application process across the state would make things easier so people are not only in the pool for PPS, but also other districts? Yeah, I, I really do. Michael adds education is an incredibly challenging career, only made more complex with a pandemic. Teaching's really hard. Substitution is really hard. So for some people, it doesn't take much to push, push them out of the job. You know, so not just the pandemic. Uh, it's it, it's a, the type of job that... Um, is, is difficult at times to, to hang in there. And just about 45 minutes ago, Governor Kate Brown tweeted about school closures. She says it is critical when schools make the difficult decision to return to distance learning that they have a timeline in place to get students back in school. She didn't elaborate as to what that timeline should be. She did also say that it is her goal to keep schools open as we weather this Omicron surge. I think it is, frankly. Like, if you look at, uh, at the story you just showed us, across the country, uh, people are quitting their jobs. For every seven people looking for a job right now, there are 10 jobs available. 
Uh, we saw Oregon's uh, quitting rate rise to 3.0 percent uh, last in October, and I think it's only gone up since then. The stats aren't out yet, but it's likely it will have increased. Uh, 4.5 million Americans quit their jobs in November. Uh, essentially, it's a it is a workers market, and employers are desperate. Well, you went through a bunch of online listings and job hunting sites. What kind of incentives did you find? Oh, it just kind of depends on what kind of job you want or what you're qualified for. Uh, if you're a registered nurse, they're going to pay you up to $10,000 right up front. If you want to be a bus driver uh, for TriMet, TriMet will give you uh, over your first few months of, of work, they'll give you $2,500. Uh, if you are simply a line cook, the company that runs concessions and sells hot dogs at the Moda Center will pay you $2.75 more per hour if you promise that you'll stay through the end of the Trailblazers season, mm. which is really more than you can say for several of the Blazers. <laughs> okay, we can talk about that later. Uh, there's been a lot of talk about the, the popular phrase, the great resignation. Anybody that you spoke with, did they say anything about this driving up salaries or minimum wage across the board? Yeah, I spoke to Josh Lehner, the state economist, who says that you aren't just seeing bonuses as a way of making up for the fact that wages aren't going up. You're seeing signing bonuses happen with wages going up. So you're seeing minimum wage rise, you're seeing hourly salaries increase, and then on top of that, people are being offered uh, anywhere from 3000 to $10,000 signing bonus as a, as a means to entice them to take the job now. Okay, so this is the million dollar question. I hope your boss isn't watching. Was there any offer that you saw that made you even think, maybe I should take a stab at that? You know, they will pay you $30,000 up front to be a long haul trucker. And there is just a little part of me that has always enjoyed the road, that likes driving at night, that doesn't want to sit on my couch. <laughs> Thinks like, you know, Maybe it's time for like kind of a Waylon Jennings lifestyle. And last week during that discussion, we gave you an exclusive interview with board chair Dave Brown going over some of the decisions that he's made over the course of the school year. Well, this morning we're going to hear from the recall effort against him, as well as learn more about the costly lesson tax mayors may learn from this whole experience. Our goal is to stop the bleeding and start the healing process. I'm going to fight for Newburgh. Uh, you know, as long as I live here. Months of outrage and thousands of signatures have led to this. One election day and a vote that may shift the power of a conservative school board. Zachary Goff is leading the recall effort against two Newburgh school board members who he says have shaken the community to its core. These two men have brought such chaos and division that it has become a distraction and it is now potentially destroying our public schools in Newburgh. Chair Dave Brown and Vice Chair Brian Shannon have been openly critical of the effort to remove them from office. 25,000 people who make up the Newburgh School District will have the chance to decide on January 18th. I'm not a fan of, of recalls in, in, in any way, shape, or form. I think they waste a lot of time. They be spent on education and they cost a lot of money. It's the first recall election of any kind in Yamhill County in the last 12 years. Already, the yes and no sides have combined to raise $100,000 in campaign contributions. But the cost to run that election, that will fall on the school district and its taxpayers. We are confident it will cost $65,000 at the bare minimum and upwards of $80,000. Those costs that we can bill are those things that the school board, the school district, and subsequently their taxpayers will, will pay for. Goff says the community can't afford to run out the clock on the two board members' terms. So the recall is the option that would remove them the quickest. Uh, and be able to bring a little bit balance uh, back to the Newburgh School District. It's the latest expense for a district running up quite the bill this school year. In addition, there's the firing of Superintendent Joe Morlock. The Newburgh Board will pay the superintendent's salary for another year. There's the expected legal fees from the pair of lawsuits over Brown and the Board's ban on Black Lives Matter and Pride flags. How do you reconcile to the taxpayers some of these costs that have come from the decisions made over the course of this school year? It's certainly a fair question. I think we just have to look in the mirror, public education in general, and say we can do a lot better because there's a ton of great teachers and ed assistants out there 
And I think once we get our focus back to education, uh, we can provide that product to the public. So is that to say that it's worth the cost to you? Well, I think it was a big factor in the decision. You know, we can't continue to go down uh, a path where we lose so many kids. But there is optimism from both sides about what this recall election may represent. Fewer than 20 percent of eligible voters in the district participated in the 2019 school board election. County Clerk Brian Van Bergen is predicting a 50 percent turnout for the January 18th recall. I guess if there's anything that good that could come out of a recall, it would be you know, getting people more engaged in their communities, in their state. Because it matters, even in these small rural towns, it really matters because things like this can, can get out of control if we don't pay attention. And again, that recall is scheduled to pay, take place on Tuesday, January 18th. Ballots should have already been mailed out. And Angelica, this is also going to involve voters in both Clackamas and Washington County because the school district makes up all three jurisdictions, or at the very least part of it. So we're going to see three jurisdictions, at least a percentage of it, taking part in that election uh, coming next week.